So we learned that Hebrew word for feast is, is uh, moedim. Can you say that with me? Moedim. Very good, moedim. And it means a special time to meet with God. So it's not a feast like Thanksgiving turkey eating a lot of food, but it's a festival of celebration with an encounter with God. Now, as believers, with the Spirit of God in us, we can have a, an encounter with God anytime, anywhere. Amen? And that's, we need that. But these were special, bigger, major encounters to really move you forward in the feast seasons here. So the three were Passover. Say that with me, Passover. Second one, Pentecost. And the third one, Tabernacles. So Passover is the spring festival, Pentecost the summer festival, and Tabernacles the fall festival. So these were three major times when God called the Jewish people to come to Jerusalem, have a visitation. And we see in the New Testament, they, they did have that major visitation that's changed the world. But within those three feast seasons are seven specific feasts, just a quick summary, and then we'll get into the one this evening. And say them with me, Passover, Passover. Unleavened, bread, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost, Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacles. And these represent seven steps in the believer's walk with God. That's, that's a whole hour teaching there, which we're not going to do, but this is God's structure and order for believers to go from new believers to walking into a more mature relationship and walk with God. Because they've kind of been done away with with the Christian world, we don't know these things, so sometimes we are kind of left to ourselves and trying to figure out, well, how do I walk with God when he's really put it here in these feast forests? So as three feast seasons, they're pictures of the person again. The Hebrew Bible is a picture book. It's a picture of the person. Jesus is the person, of course. And when it says that in the New Testament he fulfilled something, it doesn't mean he did away with. That's not what those words mean in the Bible. It means he was the human perfection of those pictures. That's what it, that's a good way of saying it. <laughs> he was the human incarnation of what the pictures were about. He lived out in his humanity the full reality in the spirit realm of these pictures. Are you with me? You get that? And since he is our representative, then we follow him in what he did and internalize the spiritual truths of these feasts within ourselves. That's how it works. But if we've been told these are no longer around for us, we're going to miss all of that. But thank God he's awakening believers around the world that, uh, that these are not feasts of the Jews, they're Jesus festivals, hallelujah. And so this puts them in a whole nother light. Now last time we talked about Passover, which has to do with us changing our position from being away from God to being with God, amen? Peace with God. And we're declared righteous because of the righteousness of Jesus is imputed to believers, those who follow him. So Passover has to do with your position before God. But how many of you know God's also interested in how you behave? <laughs> He's interested in our condition, see, our condition. And that's what unleavened bread and first fruits are all about. So there are two sides of the same coin. This teaching this evening with God's help is on unleavened bread. And next time we just turn the coin, look on the other side, it will be first fruits. So those two festivals are the part that so many Christians miss out in their everyday life is what the scholars call sanctification. 
coming out and being separate from the world. So here's what I call this, revealing unleavened bread, the feast of putting off the old. Can you say that with me? The feast of putting off the old. And you know how Paul wrote that, put off the old nature. And we'll look at that here in just a moment. It's not a pretty picture. Hallelujah. So all of this, you remember at Passover, God brought the Hebrews out of Egypt. But it took 40 years to get Egypt out of them. <laughs> Amen. Oh, we had this teaching here on Numbers, the book of Numbers, and they just murmured and complained all the time. Doubt and unbelief. Let's go back to Egypt. So it took them 40 years for a short journey because they just wouldn't get Egypt out of them. So we can certainly identify with this because God calls us out of the world at Passover, but it takes a while to get the world out of us. Amen? Amen. Hopefully not 40 years. <laughs> so all of that is shown for us in unleavened bread and first roots. So we're going to look at that here just a little bit this evening. So again, what Jesus did in the flesh by being the reality of these festivals, we internalize in the spirit. So revealing unleavened bread, the feast of putting off the old. You see the scriptures, Exodus chapter 13, 3 to 7, and Leviticus 23 and six to eight. So let's see what it says here. You know the story. When God brought the Hebrews out of Egypt, they were to leave quickly and did not have time to make bread with the leaven. That's going to take them more time, see? Now here's the deal. As a forever reminder, I kind of like the way that came out. <laughs> As a forever reminder. See, it takes a lot of time and study and effort and prayer to figure out how to say this simply in a few words so we can get it. It's easy to write a, a 10 page chapter trying to explain all this stuff, but who's gonna stay with that? So you can try to find a few words. As a forever reminder, that means they're still here today, right? As a forever reminder, God instructed the Hebrews to keep the feast of unleavened bread the day after Passover for seven days from the 15th to the 21st. So stay with me on this line here now. Since most Christians are not aware of the festivals, the feast, you had to kind of, you know, get Feast 101 here going before you get too complicated. So Passover's on the 14th, and right after that is Unleavened Bread, 15th to the 21st. So they just run right together. So sometimes in the New Testament, this time period is called Passover. Sometimes it's called unleavened bread. So it's kind of confusing. Unless you know the culture and the context, you're not really sure exactly what they're talking about. <clears throat> so Passover is the 14th. And right after that, 15th to the 21st, is unleavened bread. Right in the middle of unleavened bread is first fruits, which we'll get to next time with help from the Lord. So Passover in the New Testament is called Preparation Day or the Day of Preparation. So you'll see that in the Gospels. And it, again, without the background, you, you might not even be sure what they're talking about. So why is it called that? Because God is going to have them get all the leaven out of their house to prepare for Passover and Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is going to be a whole week. So Passover in the New Testament is called the Day of Preparation. Now look at this 15th to the 21st, where High Sabbaths, can you say that with me? High Sabbath, special holy days. Now let's stop and talk about that line for a minute. This is very, very important. It may not seem that way to you reading it in Leviticus. I understand that. It seems like, well, who cares? What's the point? Well, if you don't know the first part of the book, chances are you may misunderstand the last part of the book. If you ever gone to a movie halfway in, you don't even know who the people are. Why are they kissing? <laughs> you don't even know what they're doing. So here's the deal. 
<clears throat> there are seven high Sabbaths in the Bible. All of them are in your favorite book in chapter Leviticus 23. If you don't read that, you don't, you don't even know they're there, see? So the 15th is a high Sabbath. The 21st of unleavened bread is a high Sabbath. Uh, Pentecost is a high Sabbath, trumpet is a high Sabbath, atonement day is a high Sabbath, and the 15th and the 22nd of tabernacles are high Sabbaths. The mikra is the word. It means a special, special time of acting out the drama of redemption. And so if you don't know that, you'll read along in the Gospels, and it says Jesus was crucified. They took his body down quickly because the next day was the Sabbath. And you oh, well, that was Friday then. It has nothing to do with that at all, see? I don't want to get into that part. But my point is, if you don't know these things, you can easily misunderstand what's going on in the Gospels. So... If you have some versions of your Bible, it says, for the next day was a Sabbath, some versions will have in parentheses, for that day was a high Sabbath. See, they, the translators knew it, and they put it in parentheses, but the reader doesn't get it. It doesn't connect. So, well, it must have been Friday. Well, that's impossible. But again, I don't want to, don't want to go into all that. You just have to know the first part of the book in order to correctly understand the second part, or you can build centuries of theology on wrong stuff. Hello. It doesn't affect your salvation, no, but it affects your understanding of the Bible and your walk with God. Am I saying this kind enough and sweet enough and loving enough? <laughs> okay. Hey, I, I didn't know either, you know. I just took what they told me. You, you cannot take what somebody tells you. You have to study for yourself. Amen. A little louder. Amen. Thank you. Help me out up here now. Okay. So, all right. So here we have the 15th to the 21st. They were not to eat leaven at Passover on the 14th, nor for the next seven days. So it's getting all the leaven out of the house. And leaven is the symbol of their old life in Egypt. For us, it would be the old life outside of the Lord, our self-centered worldly life before the Lord delivered us out of all of that, the leaven of stuff in our lives that's not pleasing to the Lord. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread symbolized the Hebrews putting off their old life of bondage in Egypt. So the Feast of Putting Off. Now, you probably can figure out where this is going already. This is going to show how Jesus, or Yeshua, those who like the Hebrew name, took all of this with him in the tomb. Hallelujah. So we can put it off in our lives and live a separate life different from the way we were when he found us. Amen? Searching for the hidden leaven. Now, to get the family involved... The Jewish people came up with a, a ritual called searching for the hidden leaven. And what happened is dad would hide little crumbs of leaven in the dark corners of the house. And then he invites the family to go find them to purge out the old leaven from the house. You see that? All right. So now this is very interesting. This kid, look, he's, he's all eager. He's ready. <laughs> A family member would take a lighted candle. They didn't have electricity. No flashlights and batteries. A lighted candle. A wooden spoon. A feather. And a bag. And go through the house looking for a hidden leaven. Now why would they have all this? Because you are careful not to touch the unclean thing. Ooh. See all those phrases that you read about in the New Testament? They're all related to the feast. <laughs> but we, we don't know that. See? So when the kid finds, oh, look, Daddy, here's some hidden leaven. Wonder how that got there. Wonder how Mom missed that. Well, of course, Dad put it there, you know. So he's careful not to touch the unclean thing. He takes the little feather, see, scoops it in the wooden spoon, puts it in the bag. Then they keep going through the house like that. And then when they get it all 
scooped out and put in the bag, guess what do they do with the bag? Burn it all up. Now that they've got all that evidence of Egypt out of their house, they can expect a visitation from God. Hello? See what's going on here? Okay. Now look at this, look at this last line here. This should wake up somebody. Whichever child found the hidden leaven would receive a present 50 days later from the father called the promise of the father. Hello. So when Jesus is saying all this stuff towards the end of his life to his disciples, this is what he's talking about, see? Stay here in Jerusalem. Don't run out. You're going to fail. Wait here until the promise of the Father, 50 days later, comes upon you, which you, of course, read about in Acts chapter 2. So all of this is going on. It's a physical thing pointing to spiritual realities and truths. All right, let's look at the next slide. Now, here is Jesus, Yeshua, if you prefer. Again, God knows his son's name in all the languages of the world. So you don't have to be all spiritual about how to pronounce the Lord's name. Amen. Did I say that sweet? Okay. <laughs> okay. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. God is good all the time. So now Jesus is going to come along and he's going to do something and he's going to give a teaching during this feast season. See, he didn't do things at random. He did things that would have a significant impact on the people at the time so they could make the connection to what he was talking about. So you remember he was doing this teaching and people were following him around all day. They didn't have any falafel McDonald's stands in the Galilee. They forgot to pack their lunch, so they're hungry. 5,000 men plus the women and children. That's a lot of people. He had a big crowd. And they're hungry. And he, he's going to test his disciples. He turns to Philip. Hey, Philip, what are we going to do to feed these folks? I have no idea. But he goes tells Andrew. Now, Andrew, where was his brain? What was he thinking? He gets this little boy. Are you with me, this story? You know the story. He has five loaves of bread and two fish. Will this do, Lord? Where have you been? <laughs> do you see all these people out here and you're bringing me five loaves of bread and two fishes? Hello. <clears throat> but Jesus is going to use this as a teaching example. He's going to break the bread and give blessing to the Lord. You know, in the Bible, you don't bless the food. You bless the Lord for the food. Amen. Amen. But it's got to be food you're actually eating, but we won't go into that, you know. So he's going to multiply the bread, which represents his life. So look, 2,000 years later, he's been multiplying his life through millions of people all over the world ever since. Isn't that amazing? This is what you can get from this. And so he gives this teaching. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. Now, you know what he's talking about. When God gave them the manna for, for the 40 years, they murmured about that. But my father, see, now he's going to switch, gave you the true bread from heaven. Oh, now he's going to talk about spiritual stuff, see. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven. Now, this is interesting. We're going to look at the same teaching. He, he has to repeat it two more times. And each time he says, come down from heaven. So Jesus was not confused about who he was. If I ask people around, where are you from? Where'd you come from? Go to Texas. Where'd you come from? Oh, Arkansas. Where'd you come from? Wisconsin. Where'd you come from? Heaven. What? <laughs> what kind of nut are you? You see? Now, this is all so confusing to the people. 
who, who is this man? You know, what is he talking about? I thought he came from Nazareth or the, the Galilee. He come down from heaven? What, what is he talking about? They don't get it. He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. See, they're like the woman at the well. They don't want her to go back to the well and draw water again. They don't want to go to the grocery store and have to get bread again or make it at home, is, you know, what they did. Give, give us some of this bread. They're thinking in the natural. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Now, somebody said about Jesus, he's either a lunatic, a liar, or he's Lord. Nobody goes around saying, I'm the bread of life. So those are the three choices you have. And when you look at who he was, what he said, and what he did, you only have one option. He is who he said he was. A lunatic, a crazy person, and a liar doesn't have the kind of life that he lived and all the compassion and wisdom. Jesus was the original shock and awe Bible teacher. I wrote an article for a magazine, and I put that in there, and my friend, I wrote it for, he liked that. He put it in a big box, you know. So his teachings didn't just kind of make them think. He jarred them. He, wow, what? What did he say? 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 Shocked them. Jord them. They never heard anything like this, and they're trying to process it. <laughs> he who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst, John 6, 32 to 35. Well, of course, he's not talking about natural bread, because we eat bread, we get hungry again. So they didn't get it. He, he's watching them, he's listening to them, they're fidgeting, they're mummering, they're muttering. They're saying, what, what is this man talking about? So he, he has to give it again. I remember when I first started teaching the Bible, and Peggy said, well, why don't you give such and such? I said, well, I gave that last year. Like, hello, like they, you mean they got it or something? No, they didn't yet. They keep giving the same stuff over and over and over and over and over and over. And Jesus is going to do this. He's going to repeat the same sermon two more times. So let's look at the next one here. All right. Jesus said a second time, most assuredly I say to you, he, he who believes in me has everlasting life. There it is. I am the bread of life. Now see, they're complaining. Well, Moses, he gave us this bread for 40 years. What are you going to do to top that? Yeah, and they all died. <laughs> Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. Now watch, this is so amazing. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. There it is again. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh. Now it's going to get even more confusing for them. Which I will give for the life of the world. John six forty seven to 51. How can we eat his flesh? We're not cannibals. What is he talking about? Eating his flesh. Coming down from heaven. The bread of life. Who, who, who is? I thought this was the carpenter's son's boy from Nazareth. Who, who is this man? Who is this Jesus of Nazareth? Who is he? So they're mummering it all to themselves. And he's going to give it one more time, even more forceful. All right, let's look at the next time. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Boy, now this is getting hard. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. This is the bread, there it is again, which came down from heaven. 
not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Wow. Of course, he's talking in covenant talk here. And now they're beginning to understand. He's wanting them to do more than just chase him around for his miracles. He's wanting to, them to come and be his disciples, to follow him, to commit their lives to him. Wow. This is covenant talk, you see. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. It's just natural words, but he goes on to say the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. I want to come into you. You come into me. The two of us will become one. I will birth eternity in your heart. Wow. That was too much of a commitment for most of them. And you keep reading there at the end, it says, from that moment on, many turned away. And Jesus turned to Peter, you gonna leave too? I love his statement, Lord, where else can we go for the words of life? So that's the challenge I'm throwing out to us. We have this easy believism in America. But that's not what Jesus is calling us to. He's calling us to that covenant commitment to follow him and be his disciple, that hard word, disciple, to give our lives to him, not just follow after him for what he might can do for us. Now, if you go to the church service and you see the big sign, signs and wonders today, it's going to be filled up. And I can understand that. We all need that. But down the street is the one that says, dying to yourself sermon today. You can meet in the phone booth and have room left over. Come on, help me out. See what I mean? That's the same thing that's going on here. We have the same issues. But I'll give you the challenge. Where else are you going to go for the words of life? The world has nothing to offer us. I've never seen an NFL quarterback walk on water. We got the wrong heroes, the wrong role models. Where else can we go? Jesus is the only game in town. Nothing else for us. So his call to commitment to him is the only thing that we have left. So we might as well respond to it. Amen. Okay, so this is what's going on. So later, Moore did join and follow. Of course, he had tens of thousands of followers before it was over. Wasn't Jesus and the boys hiding out in the Galilee somewhere? In fact, that's why the establishment was afraid of him because he was threatening their position. Because oh, he says, all the, if we leave him alone, the whole world's going to follow him. Hallelujah. I think they were prophesying, maybe. All right. Jesus, our unleavened bread. Crucified on Passover, make it a little transition, and buried at the beginning of unleavened bread. See, this doesn't have anything to do, don't take offense, with with churchianity and Christianity and Western Christian holidays. This is all on the feast days because he is the reality of them. You see what I'm saying? So he's crucified at Passover. He's going to be buried at unleavened bread. So as Passover comes to a close in the evening, around 6 p.m., that's going to start the next 24-hour period on the biblical calendar. It goes begins at night. It gets confusing for us because we're solar-minded people. But in the Bible, it's the lunar calendar. So the next day actually begins at night. See? I like to say the next 24-hour period is a little less confusing because when we say day, we're waiting for the sun to come up. But when they say day, they're waiting for night to fall. 
<laughs> you see, it can be very confusing. I understand that. So look at this. Jesus, the unleavened bread of God from heaven, was buried with our leaven of sin at the same time, you see, the Jewish people were celebrating the feast. The very time they were getting the leaven out of their house, Jesus is taking the leaven out of our house, our lives, into the tomb with him. You with me? Hang in there, say la. Pause and meditate. While the Jewish people were removing the physical leaven from their houses, Jesus removed the spiritual leaven of sins from our house that is our life. Now, this is very important. He took the full burden of our human liabilities with him. Think about it. He took the full burden of our human liabilities with him into the tomb where they were buried with him at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let me tell you a little bit how they buried people. Again, you have to know the, the culture and the customs. So, in the Jewish people would bury somebody. Uh, first of all, they'd wash the body and stretch it out. Most people don't die all looking pretty, you know. Hello. So, they'd wash the body, stretch out the body. Then they would put these anointing spices. And the amount you put on the person depended on the worth that you considered the person to have. For example, the greatest of all Jewish sages in Bible times a little before is Hillel. He's their gr the great rabbinic sage of Judaism. And they buried him with 80 pounds of spices. That showed they revered him more than anybody else in their world. But they put 100 pounds on Jesus, see? That's the greatest thing they could possibly do to show his worthiness. So... This is a mixture, you can read it in the Gospels, you see, of, of aloe and myrrh. Well, what is that? Aloe is a fragrant wood. When uh, smashed into dry powder, it has a fragrance to it. You know, it's kind of like cedar, you might think. So it has a nice fragrance to it. It's smashed into dry powder. And myrrh is a gummy substance, kind of the first century super glue. So what they're doing, they're mixing the myrrh and the aloe and making this compound, and they're putting it on Jesus' body, and then they're wrapping one foot wide linen bands around from uh, armpit to ankle. This is the way he would have been wrapped up. And a hundred pounds of spices on him. He's cocooned in these wrappings. And they would leave the face and neck and the upper shoulders open. And they'd come back later and anoint that. And then he, he would, they would have a little head covering. So when it says in the Gospels, they went in and saw this head covering in a separate place, it's, it's so confusing. It doesn't mean that Jesus somehow sort of set up, hello, <laughs> unwrapped himself and put the head covering over there in the corner. No, it just means it's separate from the rest. There's a space there. You with me? There's a space there. And so this is what happened. Now, the Bible says, this, this is so important because we, we don't really grasp this that well, that uh, darkness, people love darkness more than light. Amen? The world loves the evil of darkness more than they love the light of God. Yeshua, Jesus, exposed their darkness. So they hated him. Now, if you want to see what unchecked darkness looks like, go read the Gospels. Isaiah says they beat Jesus so badly you could hardly recognize him as a human being. 
This is what unchecked darkness will do to light. And he took that for us. For us. Beat him so bad they could hardly recognize him as a human being. But they left him alive long enough so they could even make it worse and crucify him. You remember he was so weak somebody had to carry the cross beam for him. He didn't, you know, it didn't carry a cross, but that's fine. He carried a beam and they nailed him to a, a tree. The execution stake, it would be called in the Jewish way. And at nine o'clock in the morning, as the morning, the morning burnt offering sacrifice was being offered, Jesus was offered on the cross. Isn't that amazing at the same time? At three o'clock in the afternoon, as the afternoon burnt offering was being offered, see that in Leviticus, right? Jesus died exactly all of this at the same time. Then they take his body down. Remember, he's, take that imposter down so there's nothing of him left over for the next day because the next day is a high Sabbath, a feast of unleavened bread. So they take him down right before 6 p.m. or whatever time it was exactly. Joseph of Arimathea, you know, I've got an unmarked, an, an unused tomb right here nearby. We can get him in there real quick for sundown. So right at sundown, as unleavened bread starts, Yeshua Jesus, our unleavened bread of God, takes all of our human liabilities into the tomb with him. And after enduring all of that, think about it. It's beaten so bad you couldn't recognize him as a human being for us. Well, that, that didn't make you want to live right. I don't know what does. Somebody would love you that much to do that for you. Then they crucify him. They put a hundred pounds of spices on him. He's cocooned in this tomb. Let's look at the next slide. You know, Joseph comes and says, I got this place you can put him. They put this huge stone. The scholars say it was so big it had to take a whole bunch of men just to roll it. They put the rope in front of it and the Roman seal on both ends. And the establishment is still afraid of him. He's going to come out of there somehow. After all of that, amazing. Of course, Jesus didn't kind of somehow set up. You see how absurd that is. And unwrap himself a hundred pounds of stuff on top of him after all they did to him. And sort of toss away the bands and kind of stumble out somehow. You see how impossible that all is. We'll look at that next time, what happened. And so he took all of our sins into his spirit, all of our sorrows into his soul, all of our sicknesses into his flesh. All of that he took for us. This is how he was the reality of unleavened bread. Jesus, our unleavened bread. Paul writes that you put off concerning your former conduct. Here it is. This is what we were like. Oh, Lord, it's a terrible picture. The old man, the old Adam-like nature, which grows corrupt. Now, this is not a pretty picture. When you look in the mirror, don't see this. <laughs> see what Jesus has done for you. God does not see us in our sins. He sees us in his son. Amen. But this is what he's delivered us from. This is what he took into the tomb. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, Contentions, jealousies, but terrible list, isn't it? Outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, my goodness, revelries, and the like. There's more. He just gives up and the like. <laughs> of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past that those who practice such things will not inherit 
the kingdom of God. Doesn't mean you've never done any of this. That's the, we've all done some of this, or all of it, or some of it. It means practice is not your way of life. This is not who you see when you look in the mirror. This is not the way you live your life. But if you've been born again, if you've been redeemed, you don't live this way anymore. You might mess up from time to time and do something on this list. Nobody's perfect yet in the image of his son. God sees us that way by grace through faith. Amen. But he's saying, practice, live this way as your lifestyle. It means you've never had an encounter with God if this is, if this is who you are. Because this is what Jesus took into the tomb with him. And since he endured all that for us, wouldn't we want to live a way that would make his heart glad, not sad? <laughs> Amen. So this is basically Romans 6. Christians don't know that. The pastors don't know that because they don't, they're not connected to the feast. But the Apostle Paul, a Jewish man, he said, you're crucified with him, buried with him, raised with him. He's talking about Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. See? That's what he's talking about. It's all connected. So what he did for us, we internalize and walk it out in our everyday lives. So he gives three words quickly, and we'll move on to the next slide. He's in Romans 6. He says, know, reckon, and yield. Those are the three words to be appropriating this for your life. Know, reckon, and yield. Know means you have to know it. But it doesn't come by head knowledge. It has to come by the Spirit. It has to have the eyes of our understanding open. You have to study it. You have to meditate on it. Things people don't have the discipline for. Until God opens your spiritual eyes to see this, the Bible is a spiritual book. It can only be understood by the Spirit. So to know means a spiritual awakening to it. And then he says reckon. That means internalize it. Take what Jesus did in his flesh for you and internalize it inside you. Internalize it. And then yield, live it out. That's what this is talking about in Romans chapter 6. To know, to reckon, and yield. Come out from among them and be separate. All those statements in the New Testament. Our worldly attitudes, our selfishness, all of the stuff that's on that list, Jesus died for all of that. For you and for all humanity. No wonder his suffering was so horrible. Separating from the world, which has absolutely nothing to offer us. Let us keep the feast. What does it say here? Here is 1 Corinthians 5, 7 to 8. He says, therefore, purge out the old leaven. You see what he's talking about now, right? That you may be a new lump. <laughs> Since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ the Messiah, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, watch this. He says, let us keep the feast. Not with old leaven. Nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So let's keep this slide up here for a minute because I need to talk to you about it a minute. Paul is writing this to the believers in Corinth. These are primarily Gentile believers, what we'd call Christians. He's telling them to keep the feast. This is around 44 AD, 14 years after Jesus was crucified buried and resurrected. Paul goes into this wicked, wicked city of Corinth and brings many people to faith. And most of them are Gentiles, what we later call Christians, as I said. And this is what he says to them. 
So it wasn't something done away with. He's just saying, let's have the right attitude in doing this. And you look at this word, sincerity. Say that word with me. Sincerity. sincerity. It's an interesting Greek word. Just a few minutes and we'll be through here. It means to be sun-tested. What in the world does that mean? See, you got to know the background. Here's the deal. Here's the word picture. If you're making, if you're making pottery, and you're making this vase, and you make a mistake and it cracks, well, you've got some money and time invested in this vase. You don't want to discard it. So you take some wax and you fill in the crack. Ooh. It should be sold at the outlet store, but no, you got it top price in your retail store. But if you're not an honorable person, you probably have it in one of the shelves up there that's kind of in the dark. So an unsuspecting potential buyer can't see that it's a cracked pot. So you know what they do? They take it outside and they hold it up to the sun and the sun will expose where that wax has been filled in and they know this is a second-hand product. Well, I'll take it for 50% off or put it back on the shelf. So what the Apostle Paul is saying here is our life should be sun-tested by the S-O-N. Tested by the sun to be found without wax. That means we're not pretending to be something we're not. If we profess something, we should live it. If we say we're followers of Jesus, we should act like him. We should talk like him. We should think like him. We're the name bearers. When we go into a place, the atmosphere should change because you're the carrier of salvation. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world because he is in you. Our lives when tested by the S-O-N, should be found without wax. No crackpots in the kingdom. We should be who we say we are. That's what unleavened bread is about. So Lord, we thank you for this revelation for us. We thank you for Yeshua Jesus being this reality. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that comes to import this inside of us. Let us put off the old and put on the new and walk in newness of life. Amen and amen. God bless you and shalom.